Okay, this is a, uh, a sculptural set that's in the Prado, that famous museum in Spain, not the one in Balboa Park, um, that depicts Seneca advising Nero. You can see the skulking, insolent Nero sitting there, barely paying attention, and then Seneca's got a very long scroll um, of advice for him, which seems to be going unheeded. Um, this work is addressed directly to Nero, a known and in fact famous person. He was emperor of Rome. And it's part, can I borrow your book for a second? I broke my own rule and didn't bring my book, but I want to quote the very opening of it, where he says, I have assumed the task, Nero Caesar, of writing about mercy so that in some sense I might fulfill the purpose of a mirror and reveal you to yourself as one who is destined to gain the greatest of all pleasures. So first of all, I explained to you before how there's a kind of genre of letter writing known as mirror of princes. And what that means is that the letter writer holds up a mirror which reveals what the uh, person, usually a prince or a king or somebody that a philosopher thinks needs advice, um, reveals who they are to themselves. And you can tell by this uh, rhetoric, reveal to yourself as one who is destined to gain the greatest of all pleasures. And you find this what I call diplomatic rhetoric, okay? Diplomatic rhetoric basically works like this. You want to convince somebody to do something. They're more powerful than you are. So you can't say, do this, you idiot. <laughs> what you have to do is say, I see that you are inclined to do such and such, and that is very good thing, okay? whether they're inclined to do it or not. Or you say, I see that you're not doing such and such, and that's very good. It would be a bad thing, and one would be a bad person to do that. That thing that they're supposedly not doing is, in fact, what they are actually doing. Okay, but you have to wrap it in this diplomatic rhetoric, or it won't be received well, and won't have the intended effect. So. I don't know how much you know about Nero, but he's one of the great bad guys of history, playing a fiddle while Rome burned and so forth, right? He, he considered himself a great artist, and he made people sit there and listen to him doing performances, and people were like, ah, oh, this is terrible, but you can't say that. You criticize him, and then, and then you wake up dead the next day or something, right? So, uh, and, and he's sort of an insufferable, horrible guy, and, you know, after huge parts of Rome burned down, lots of people died and so forth, he built the biggest palace of all time, devoted to himself, and with a colossal statue of himself and so forth. Okay, and so there's, there's a bit of awkwardness in the fact that this stoic philosopher is advising this horrible tyrant. And it really creates for us this crisis of interpreting everything in Seneca, as I thought was really brought home when I read the first page of James Rom's biography of Seneca called Dying Every Day, where he says, look, you can look at it like this, yes, he's an earnest philosopher doing his best under hard circumstances, or he's this really cynical manipulator who's <clears throat> using a stoic philosophy to mask this, uh, his own um, uh, extremely wealthy, powerful status and covering over crimes that he's engaged in, like usury to people in Britain and things like that. So, um, it, it is, you know, the biggest problem with this work on mercy is this part at the very beginning that says, to the Emperor Nero. I mean, that already causes a big, enormous problem of interpretation here and, 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 and what's going on here. But that is the reason why there's this diplomatic rhetoric saying, 
you're great, you're a wonderful guy, you're practically like God, and so forth. I mean, why would you, why would you be praising somebody we actually know from historical sources to be bad? And the answer to that is diplomatic rhetoric. Okay, sort of a lost art nowadays, because we don't really do diplomacy anymore. We just show up and say, look, we're going to bomb you if this doesn't happen. But there used to be this way of doing things where you sort of, you know, oh, I see that you're inclined to pull your troops out of there, and that would be a very good thing, because, you know, it would cause a world war if you didn't, and so on. So there's diplomatic rhetoric in here. Now, we know that the thing was written between 55 and 56 AD, and there's a sort of, there's a set of facts external to this text about who Nero was, what he did, uh, and so forth. And to some extent, we can criticize what's going on here by reference to that. And we can understand why this diplomatic um, rhetoric is involved, because we know he actually was a powerful person. One, one way, then, to read it... You know, I have a Kindle on my Kindle. My okay, phone. very good. I'll, then I'll borrow your book, as it were. Uh, and if you need to borrow anything, let me know. Um, so, um, what, one way to read this is, again, Ernest Cicero, real Stoic philosopher, trying to improve the world. He's got a difficult situation. Would it make it a better world if he just abandoned his post and went on and did something else? No, you've got to... You've got to try to rein these people in. Like the anonymous guy who wrote a New York Times op-ed saying, we've got this crazy guy in office, but I'm going to stay here and keep doing things to make sure it's like kept under, under control. And admitted, you know, this guy's insane, but don't worry, there's able people that are, that are reining him in. That's one way you might look at what what's happening with Seneca here, is that he's the same guy in the room and he's doing everything he can to maintain stability and order, and that if you've got somebody who really is cruel and really is tyrannical, then you need to use this diplomatic language in order to um, moderate him and improve things. But, of course, the other way to look at it is that what this is is a big published open letter coming from this famous guy Seneca, and he's a credible philosopher, and what it is is a piece of propaganda to make it look like Nero's actually a good guy who listens to philosophers and is being, being refined and so forth. And so we get all this stuff about um, how a king behaves versus a tyrant, and Combined with the mode of diplomatic rhetoric I was telling you about, yes, you're, I see you're doing this and that's a good thing, or I see you're not inclined to do such and such, and I'm glad you're not doing that, then it makes it, makes it appear like he's basically um, saying that Nero is not a tyrant, he isn't a bad guy, he's more like a king, and he's a merciful person, and so forth. And in particular, it makes him look good relative to these other examples of bad guys like Nero's immediate imperial predecessors, Claudius and Caligula, true monsters in their own right. But what we do is we sort of make Nero look good by contrast, by showing he's following the advice of philosophers, he's inclined to be merciful, and so on. And so this whole thing is not an earnest philosopher trying to improve things, but is Seneca, the propagandist, using the mask of Stoic philosophy to cover up monstrous crimes and so forth. How do we figure out which one is, is actually the case? Well, we don't have the means to resolve that, for one thing, because we don't have access to the documentary materials and the historical facts that would be relevant to resolving that dispute. So we have to look at the internal literary coherence and philosophical value of this work. So I give you a couple of different modes of how to criticize it. And criticism here means interpret it and figure out if it's a good or a bad thing. It doesn't just mean treating it negatively. and, and It means treating it critically. So first thing is that it's practical philosophy. If it's practical philosophy, then it needs to have outcomes, okay? Because empty are the words of a philosopher that relieve no suffering, and so forth. 
And practical philosophy, we don't want to know about health, we want to be healthy. We don't want to know what wealth is, we want to have a lot of it. And mainly, we don't want to know what living well or happiness is, we want to actually be happy and live well. And so a practical philosophy that doesn't actually produce these things is as worthless as an institution like a business school that supposedly teaches people about business, but then they go on bankrupt or just as broke as everybody else studying some other field. Totally worthless thing to have, because the entire point of it is to be practical and produce some effect. Or economics. We don't want to just know about the economy. We want to be able to predict when it's going to collapse and when there's going to be problems with the economy. So if we have a field that supposedly tells us we got perfect economic theories here, yes, we didn't predict the biggest economic crisis since 1929, but you know that's how it goes. We're a theoretical, not a practical thing. Okay? You might say, no, that's flawed and its whole, its whole reason for existing is called into question. There is no point in having a merely theoretical approach to practical philosophy. So in that sense, if this work didn't actually make Nero a merciful person and improve him and so forth, then it's a worthless piece of garbage that nobody should, should read or consider. And from a philosophical perspective, it's a spectacular example of a failed piece of philosophy. Okay, because the success condition of a piece of practical philosophy is that it actually improves someone's life or something. Not that, not that it merely produces some kind of knowledge or definitions or whatever. Okay, so in that case, this is one of the worst pieces of philosophy to ever have been written. Because we know the fact of the matter is that this is one of the least merciful people of all time. And so it did not have its intended consequences or effect, but that is the success condition of a piece of practical philosophy. Okay, now on the other hand, we could look at it as actually being a kind of piece of theoretical philosophy, examining whether mercy is a good thing, how mercy does relate to justice, whether it's a virtue or a vice. And there is some theoretical fact of the matter here. Like, it either conflicts with justice, or it does help with justice. Or it's, it's equivalent to pity, or it's not. Or it's a good alternative to cruelty, or it's not. The wise person will practice mercy, or she will not. Okay, and in that sense, it doesn't matter how Nero reacted to it. The success condition is, is the thing coherent? Does it make internally coherent arguments, and does it edify us? Does it tell us something about virtue, and about uh, government, and about justice, and that sort of thing? So that we could use it for other people. We could give this to Donald Trump and say, this is how you should, you should act, and maybe he'll take it better than Nero did. I wouldn't hold my breath on that, but maybe something like that will happen, and it's a and it doesn't matter if it succeeded in its local context, what matters is whether, is whether it's true or not. And, and whether it's true or not, first of all, depends on whether it's coherent and makes a coherent argument. So again, since we don't really have the historical facts that would let us really figure out the situation with, res with respect to it being a piece of practical philosophy, we will focus on the theoretical issues it raises, and primarily the issue of whether Seneca makes a coherent argument or not. Okay, so here's the structure of the work. The work as it stands is incomplete. It ends with three dots, okay, which means that our manuscripts did not report the complete work. In fact, an entire book seems to be missing. So we have two books but the description that Seneca gives of what he's going to do is in three parts, as described in section three of book one. The first part will deal with the remission of punishment. The second will attempt to show the nature and appearance of mercy. 
For since there are certain vices that simulate virtues, they cannot be distinguished without the stamp of marks that enable you to tell them apart. In the third place, I shall look into the question of how the mind is led to adopt this virtue, how it establish it, establishes it, and through use, makes it its own. So that third part is missing, so we're not going to be able to say much about that. And this first part, which is actually the majority of what we have, essentially goes into explaining why one ought to think mercy to be a good thing. Okay, but first of all, we're probably all inclined to accept those arguments anyway, and if we aren't, it's probably because we don't understand what mercy actually is. And therefore, the second part is crucial to the project of resolving the theoretical value of the work and whether it's coherent. We need to examine the definitions given of mercy, figure out if it is a virtue, and if so, how it relates to and can be cohere with the other virtues identified by Stoics. Okay, but I'll give you a sampling of some of the stuff in the first section. And the initial question raised is mercy a virtue? And you might think it's not, for the reason given in section two. Mercy sustains the worst kind of people. It has no purpose unless a crime's been committed. And the only virtue, it's the only virtue that seems to find no employment among those are, who are guiltless. So it only happens when somebody's done something wrong and they need to be punished, and then you sort of refrain from giving that punishment, or at least giving the full punishment. So it's strange, because it's not a virtue, it doesn't seem much like a virtue like um, justice or temperance or courage or something where it's its own thing. It's in relation to other people and in relation to bad people. And if you have a world where nobody's doing anything bad and nobody's committing any crime, kind of stoic cosmopolitan utopia or something, this wouldn't even exist. It wouldn't arise as an issue. So how can it be a virtue? How can it be something that we inculcate as a, as a habit and practice uh, constantly? So Seneca gives several responses to that. First he says, well, by that argument, medicine wouldn't be any good. After all, medicine only treats the sick. So suppose I tried to discourage you from going into medical school and said, what value does medicine have? All, it, it only works if you're treating somebody who's diseased and sick. That's not a good thing. Okay, that's a lame argument with respect to medicine, and so by analogy, it's lame with respect to this. Yes, maybe it only deals with people who are flawed, who are mentally ill, or something in some way, but there can be a, a sort of virtuous activity in connection with that. Furthermore, it doesn't only benefit the guilty. It can benefit the innocent because often innocent people are accused wrongly or even convicted wrongly, in which case mercy restores justice to those people. And this is, this is if, if you want to focus your mind on the most vivid case of this, think about capital punishment where the state kills people. Okay? And it turns out the state kills people that were totally innocent of the crime sometimes. It just happens. They got convicted by a jury that was led on by their emotions or by, by skilled attorneys or whatever, and ends up executing innocent people, an irreversible thing. So if mercy was employed by judges in those cases, or by legislators in getting rid of the death penalty, or that sort of thing, then it could be good. You actually would be saving, saving those innocent people who were wrongly accused. And finally, it can return people to virtue, assuming we have a rehabilitative model of punishment. Merciful punishment might be more effective in encouraging the bad to return to virtue, return to justice, return to moderation, return to courage, and so forth, in which case you really are working on an attempt to morally develop someone. Question? So what would be the difference between simply punishing someone and punishing someone mercifully? Uh, the, the boundary that you draw? Well, we'll see that when we get to 
the definitions, but it has to do with withholding something from justified punishment, not giving the full punishment. So, for example, using discretion. If the, if the sentence is that they should be sentenced from 20 years to life, you give something more like 20 years instead of life in prison. And that's, that's merciful compared to throw the book at them and just and, and give them life in prison or execute them. Okay, so it withholds something from what is in theory a just punishment. And as we'll see, that, that's what actually creates the problem of whether it can cohere with other virtues, especially justice. But Seneca certainly implies that it is. In fact, he launches into one of his rhetorical tirades, you know, no virtue is more human, right? It must be generally accepted that no other is more appropriate for a human, a belief to be held not just by those of us, i.e. Stoics, who regard humans as social creatures born for the good of all, but also for those, like the Epicureans, who consign humans to pleasure, whose words and actions all look to their own advantage. For if repose and quiet are what we're seeking, then he finds this virtue, which loves peace and holds back the hand, consonant with its own nature. But of all, mercy becomes none so well, that is, is fitting for none so well as a king or an emperor. That is, you, Nero. So, in this passage, Seneca seems to say, definitely a virtue for Stoics, definitely a virtue for Epicureans, Every person is either a Stoic or an Epicurean, and therefore, it's a virtue for everyone. It's fitting for everyone. Each of you individuals in this room, and especially you, Nero. Right? I don't know whether you're an Epicurean or a Stoic, but in any case, it's the most human virtue. Okay, and we have to talk about who mercy applies to. So, in one sense, there's a, there's a strict sense in which it applies to somebody issuing a sentence to a criminal. Okay, that's sort of the paradigm case, is sentencing, okay, in a criminal justice system. But, by extension, it applies to any relation where there's a power differential. So, you could be merciful towards your animals, right? If, if my cat won't get off of the table while I'm trying to eat dinner, I can either coax it off with a snack, or I can push it off the table. And if I'm a merciful person, I'll do something more like the former instead of the latter. Or how parents treat children, right? They put their hand in the cookie jar, they can either get spanked, or they can uh, have to go without having dessert the next night or something, and that's, and that's merciful. Masters can either be cruel towards their slaves, or nice towards them. He goes into many, many examples um, about that. It applies to bosses and employees. It applies to generals and soldiers. It applies to kings or emperors and their subjects, and that's the immediate prima facie target of this particular one. Um, I thought you might have found it interesting that it applies to the relation of, between teachers and their students. So quoting from section 16 of book one, which teacher more worthily represents liberal studies? The one who flays his pupils' backs if their memory fails, or if the eye is not quick and falters in reading, or the one who prefers to use gentle criticism and a sense of shame to impart correction and instruction? Okay, so ask yourself which of those you would prefer, and notice that there's no other options. Um, so there's nothing like just letting them off or something. You either you, I, I, I either play on your sense of shame, or I have to whip you um, and, and, and use corporal punishment. So you could, you could think of Monty Johnson as being a very merciful person because he merely embarrasses and shames you and does not actually beat you like some people who don't, don't buy into this virtue of mercy would do. Okay, and... Um, as we've become accustomed, there's all this soul-searching about, am I being a real Stoic here or not? You notice from the list of virtues that I gave you, 
that mercy didn't seem to appear on that official list of virtues? Is that because I'm slack and just left it off? No, it's because, you know, hardcore Greek Stoics didn't seem to mention this one. And Seneca is sort of innovating or introducing it as a notion. And so the question arises, how orthodox does a Stoicism remain? And of course, Stoicism has this reputation for being a really unforgiving uh, and strict and stern kind of philosophy. So as he says, I'm aware that the Stoic school is regarded unfavorably by the ill-informed as excessively harsh and quite unsuited to giving advice to princes and kings. It's criticized for maintaining that the wise man does not show pity or forgiveness. Such a position is hateful if formulated in the abstract, for it appears to leave no hope for human error, but rather to consign all offenses to punishment. Okay, now, that's Seneca describing the way you would think Stoics handle punishment. Okay, you read their philosophy and it doesn't look like there's much room to cut people slack. You're either a sage or you're a fool. You're either entirely virtuous or you're entirely vicious. All vice is equal and equally bad and so on. But he says, if this is the case, what kind of philosophy is it that tells us to forget the lessons of our own humanity and to close up the surest haven against misfortune, that of helping one another? But no school is more kind and gentle, none more loving of mankind and more devoted to the common good, so that its guiding principle is to be, is be useful and helpful and to consider not merely self-interest, but that of each and every person on earth. So this is Seneca's kind of warm, fuzzy version of Stoicism, if you will, that Stoicism is really about recognizing our common humanity and cultivating that, being concerned with other people, not just wanting to get my vengeance or something when I'm punishing somebody, but really caring about how can I improve? That person hurt me, yes, but how can I actually help them improve and become a better person? Because we're all in this human boat together, uh, and so on. So, I think this is interesting because he acknowledges it's not in line with the perception, the prima facie perception one has of Stoicism, but there is a, is a way of thinking of Stoicism in which something like mercy has its place. Okay, so the definitions of mercy finally come in the third chapter of the second book, which you might think is a very disorderly thing. Come on, we're philosophers here. It ought to, you know, definitions ought to come in the first chapter of the first book. You can't do anything unless you have definitions. That's how it is in Euclid. You open up Euclid and there's a set of definitions and then it moves on to everything else. Right? So, but we have to read through an entire book talking about how great mercy is before we get to an account of what it is. Okay? And as I said, this is what we need to concentrate on. He introduces it by saying, I'm going to say what mercy is, what its nature is, and what are its limitations. And I've put into bold the subsequent four different definitions of it that are given. The first one, mercy consists in controlling the mind when one has the power to take revenge, or in the forbearance of a superior towards an inferior in determining punishment. So that looks like a fine definition, but Seneca says it would be safer to put forth more definitions, and in case a single one doesn't sufficiently cover the subject and, so to speak, loses its case. Therefore, mercy can also be described as the inclination of the mind towards mildness in exacting punishment. And that actually seems to be the closest formulation to the concept of virtue that he had been employing in book one and that he employs in the rest of book two. But, while we're piling on definitions, the next definition will find objections despite coming very close to the truth. So pay attention to this one. If we describe mercy as the moderation that removes something from the due and merited punishment. Okay. In a way, this is the key definition. As he explains, in effect trying to preempt the criticism, 
the protest that will, will be raised that no virtue bestows on a man less than he deserves. Okay? But here is a definition of a putative virtue as a kind of moderation. Well, that's virtue talk. Moderation, temperance, self-control. Moderation, but moderation that removes something from due and merited punishment. And then he winds up this litany of definitions. However, everyone understands the fact that mercy consists in stopping short of the penalty that may, might have been deservedly fixed. Okay, that one is also similar to the third definition, in that it acknowledges a due and merited or deserved punishment and then defines mercy as the withholding or stopping short of that which is due. Yeah? Um, so, just so I understand, it seems that mercy is like a cross between temperance and justice? As in the virtue? Well, um, it certainly, the term moderation could have, the, 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 the relevant Latin term could easily have been translated temperance as well. So temperance is coming in here. The idea of, of being temperate, like not being flying off the handle, um, not, not being excessive, and so forth. So certainly it looks like temperance is relevant. Now, justice is relevant, but this seems to be, instead of embodying our idea of justice, to be conflicting with it in a way. Okay, so what is our definition of justice? Well, here's the definitions I gave you on that crucial handout. Okay, justice, knowledge of the distribution of proper value to each person. According to Cicero, a disposition of mind preserved for the common good, attributing to each person his worth or a disposition of mind to assign to each person his share according to his worth. As opposed to injustice, the, the antithesis of this, ignorance of the distribution of proper value to each person. Okay, so if we intertranslate the, this idea of proper value as corresponding to due, deserved, fitting, and so forth, punishment, then what justice is, is that if you deserve a certain form of punishment, then justice requires I give you that form of punishment. Okay, so if death is the, is the deserved form of punishment for a mass murderer or something, then if I put you to death, I'm doing what's just. And that's why even though judges kill people by giving them capital punishment, we don't then imprison them or execute them for doing it. We say they're just people. They get to wear these robes and stuff because they are, they're actually doing what's just and what's good. That's a virtuous thing they're doing. If they sentence a man to life in prison who did these really bad things, then we don't think that's bad or cruel or harsh. We think that, that person is doing what is just. And it's, it's hard to do what's just. It'd be nice to be able to be slack towards people, let students slack off and not actually do their research and stuff. That's a lot easier to do. It's very hard to, to punish them and, and shame them and make them do the things that you, that you want. But good teachers do that because that's the just thing. That's what, the, that's what these people deserve and what they, they merit. It'd be easy to just give everyone an A, but not everybody actually merits or deserves that kind of grade. And justice is giving each person the grade they actually deserve. No less and no more. Okay, so if we take these technical definitions of justice, now all of these are external to the text we're dealing with. As far as I know, there isn't a definition of justice in this text. Okay, but I don't think that uh, Seneca has in mind any other definition than these standard Stoic ones, and therefore we have a problem between his definition of mercy and 
of justice. And I try to spell this problem out here. Okay? So take the definition that justice is an inclination of the mind to give each person what is due and merited to them. If that's the case, and if mercy is an inclination of mind towards moderation and removing something from due and merited punishment, then justice and mercy will conflict and be mutually exclusive. Justice will require giving the due and merited punishment. Mercy will require stopping short and withholding the due and merited uh, punishment. But of course, virtues can't conflict with one another. A wise person has to be able to manifest all virtues consistently. And wisdom has to tell, has to be a virtue that applies to the right action being taken. But if the action could be just if I give the full punishment or don't give it, then wisdom can't, uh, can't be the description of the right uh, frame of mind for making the decision. So either justice or mercy will not be able to be a virtue. Now, of course, we can't get rid of justice. We can get rid of practically every other virtue, but we need justice. So therefore, mercy can't really be a virtue. And this is why he's concerned in addressing these people who say it can't be a virtue, because it doesn't look like it fits. Now, uh, there, is, there is my concept of the problem that's going on with this essay. Do we, any, any questions or comments about that problem before I try to show you how, he, how I think he resolves it? Any, any difficulty grasping what the problem is, though I went through it so quickly? Yeah. Um, what, what is, who decides what is due and merited? Is it the wise. The wise. Yeah. But then, okay. So, a wise person will know what's due and merited, because a wise person is necessarily just. And justice just is a disposition of the mind to give the due and merited thing. And so they must apprehend what is due and merited. Yeah? If a wise person knows what's due and merited, and they also have mercy, then the amount of punishment they give, shouldn't that be the due and merited? Well, that's the problem. They know what's due and merited. But supposedly there's a virtue that says not giving what's due and merited is a, just, is a virtue. Right? I mean, the, the virtue has been defined as withholding what is due and merited, whereas justice is defined as giving what is due and merited. And you can't both give and not give what is due and merited at the same time, and yet the just person has to act, has to give a sentence or whatever. So it looks, looks like a definitional problem. Uh, so maybe he's giving mercy as virtue from Nero because he's already acting in, injustly in the first place and like offering him a, a way of redeeming. Ah, okay, but then that would be like saying some people need to be unjust in order to be just. Or maybe now, is a Stoic really going to be able to say that? that? Yes, this is unjust, but he's so cruel and so evil that if he just thinks unjustly, then it, it, it's like the, the stick is bent so far this direction that we have to bend it all the way this direction in order to make it straight and right. And so if we just get him to do something really unjust, like not punishing, withholding due punishment, then maybe it'll end up somewhere in the middle and he'll actually end up doing the right thing. Okay, but then there is no way for the wise person then to be consistent to, uh, and, and so on. I mean, then that, that's a sort of consequentialist uh, approach to this. Okay? Question? Uh, like, if the mercy is not a virtue, I, I feel like it would be difficult for him to persuade others to be merciful. Well, right. If it's not, if it's not a virtue, why, why do I want it? But he's claiming he wants people to be merciful, so he's claiming it's a virtue. But the problem is... We have to ask, is it coherent for a Stoic to say mercy is a virtue? Yes, we want to rein in this horrible tyrant who's, who's 
giving excessive punishments and punishing people that don't deserve it and, and stuff, and we have this really bad situation. We need to rein that in. Should we do what Michael says and convince him, oh, just don't punish anyone? We know that's not just, but at least that would be better or something. It doesn't seem like that, that avenue is available to Stoics. So here's the, the solution that he seems to pursue. First of all is distinguish mercy from pity, a closely aligned notion. Second is characterize the opposite of mercy as not being justice, withholding the due punishment or giving the due punishment, but that mercy is the opposite of cruelty and define cruelty as some kind of obvious vice. And compare mercy instead with sternness. Sternness is always giving the, the maximum punishment that's due and merited. Um, and then argue something like that, well, sometimes sternness is appropriate, but sometimes mercy is appropriate. It depends on the circumstances. You have an absolutely horrible monster, yes, give them the full thing. But you have somebody who's sort of misguided and made some bad decisions and they had a bad upbringing and so on cut them some slack. Okay, the problem with that is that then we would be making mercy and sternness into a kind of indifferent matter, and then we choose the appropriate one in order to arrive at the virtuous condition like we do with things that are indifferent, and maybe we call mercy the preferred indifferent and sternness the dispreferred, or maybe we use the opposite, but anyway it's an indifferent. But if that's the case, then mercy would not be a virtue, because indifference aren't virtues. That's exactly what they aren't. Okay, so let's compare, let's look at the definitions of cruelty. You know, only in philosophy do we actually need to give definitions of cruelty. You, you think you know what it means, but then you start talking to a philosopher. Okay, nothing other than harshness of mind in punishment. Cruelty is an inclination of the mind to harsh thoughts, and especially when in the context of punishment. What about pity, the other side, sort of the opposite of cruelty? What is pity? Pity, in, this, in his definition, a mental sorrow caused by the sight of other people's wretchedness. You see a really pathetic, horrible situation, and that makes you sad. Right? Pity is that feeling of sadness that, like, look at what a horrible world we live in. Right? This, is, this is the condition. If you don't feel pity, there must be something wrong with you. If you look at how horribly screwed up our world is right now. Right? Sadness induced by the suffering of others, which, seems, which they seem not to deserve. Right? Something, something is happening to these people. They don't deserve to go hungry. They don't deserve to have their country being bombed. They don't deserve to have their children kidnapped, whatever. And so one feels sadness for them. Okay. The problem is that on the Stoic view, a wise person cannot possibly have pity. Because then, if it was true that pity is a mental sorrow caused by the sight of others' wretchedness, then the wise person would be the most miserable person in the world, because they would have the greatest apprehension of the sufferings of others, and thus they would have the greatest mental sorrow that accompanies that. So you'd look at a, you'd look at a Stoic sage, and it would be somebody just like Heraclitus, weeping at everything they see. But the Stoic sage is supposed to be more like the Democritean character who looks at all this absurd stuff and laughs at it, okay, and maintains their tranquility, okay, not because it's all a joke or it's funny that, that, that bad things are happening to people, but because this is all a result of, of, of um, folly and lack of wisdom, and it can be corrected and improved and addressed with wisdom and calm cultivation of virtues and so forth. So the wise cannot possibly extend pity. Pity cannot be a virtue, or else the wise will be the most miserable people. So he sets up something like a continuum here between pity, mercy, sternness or strictness, and cruelty. So pity, Inclination of the mind towards sorrow caused at the sight of another's wretchedness is a kind of vice. 
okay? Think of it as it's an emotion. It's a bad pathological emotion to be put into a sad state whenever you see pathetic suffering and pitiful people. You go into a sad state. That itself is a character vice, okay? And it's the opposite. At the opposite end is something like cruelty, inclination of the mind towards harshness and exacting punishment. So I have a chance to punish this, this person, and so I exact the most harsh thing. Oh, they handed in something late? Fail. Right? Um, <coughs> cat jumped on the table, kicked the cat out of the house, it no longer gets fed. Right? The child didn't learn their ABCs, okay, they never get to eat dessert again um, and have to stay in their room and so forth. Um, so that's cruelty, and in between we have this putatively virtuous condition. So then we set mercy up as a virtue, which is inclination of the mind towards mildness and exacting punishment, as opposed to being harsh, and certainly we can differentiate it from inclining towards sadness. Where does that leave sternness or strictness? Suppose somebody has an inclination not towards harshness in exacting punishment, but towards firmness when exacting punishment, and giving the maximum of what's deserved. These people are, are um, th this person's a criminal. They get this punishment. Now, this plays out in the real world of um, law and order in the issue about to what extent should judges be given discretion in sentencing. Okay, so some people think judges should be given no discretion in sentencing. If such and such a crime is committed, then the, the, such and such a punishment must be imposed. And California had this law that said this three strikes you're out law. You commit, you commit three crimes in a row, you go, to, you go to prison for life. And we had a situation where, you know, uh, okay, when the guy was 18, he shoplifted from 7-Eleven, and then later, and he was convicted for that, later he did a drug deal, and then, um, and then he stole somebody's car. Now, stealing somebody's car, he served punishments for those other two, Stealing somebody's car is normally you spend a year in prison, but three strikes, you're out. You spend life in prison if that happens, okay? Now, we got rid of that law essentially because it's cruel. It's too much punishment. It's too harsh. It goes way too far. Or you think of even crueler punishments. You steal, we cut off your hands, right? Um, the... Uh, we clearly want to get away from those, but sternness in punishment, giving the maximum of a punishment that somebody deserves, that's not a vice, that's not cruel. In fact, that looks just like the definition of justice, giving each person what they are due. And this nice colorful picture I've constructed here has got one enormous problem, which is that virtues and vices can't lie on a continuum for the Stoics. You either are virtuous or you're not. We don't have a thing where, oh, he's pretty virtuous, he's usually, he's usually strict, but he's merciful in, in some situations. Sometimes he actually gives in to pity, right? Or sometimes he's cruel. No, these have to be categorically different, and they have to represent firm, established habits of mind. So do we want people to have a firm, established habit of mind so that they are always giving the exact punishment. That would be the view that judges should not have discretion in sentencing. And we have that situation where, for certain crimes, there is no judicial discretion for sentencing. We have other crimes, however, where there is discretion. And this is when you see sentences that are five years, five to ten years, or, you know, um, committing committing robbery uh, 5 to 10 years, committing robbery with a weapon 10 to 30 years. There's still latitude there. 